Good morning. And welcome to worship today. Am I on? Is my mic on? Should be? Okay. Okay, I'm going to assume and I'll, okay, thank you, Kristen. My name is Pam Smith. I'm the pastor here at Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church in Lakeland, Florida. And a warm welcome to each of you who are worshiping with us today, whether here on site or over the wonders of the internet. We are grateful for your presence. And a holiday weekend it is, right? Fourth of July weekend. The festivities have started and many people are traveling. Others of us are staying put and grateful for that. But we remember today, and we remember on Tuesday particularly, um, the creation of this country and the, the ideals on which it was founded. And we give thanks to God for those ideals. A couple of announcements. Um, this month is Christmas in July as part of our social ministry outreach. Um, and this is a time when we don't do an outreach, we do an inreach uh, because we recognize that there are things that we need to have here at church to make our engines run smoothly. And some of those items are on ornaments on the Christmas tree in the narthex. So if you are able to help provide some of those items ranging anywhere from plastic forks to copy paper, we are grateful for your contributions that help things go easier here. For those of you who are planning on attending the women's retreat that I am leading September 13th and 14th, if you have expressed to me your desire to go and have not received a confirmatory email from me, please email me so that we can um, make sure we only have nine slots um, plus mine, and I think we're at eight right now, so I wanna make sure that, um, that we don't give false hope to somebody who wants to attend. So if you have not received confirmatory email from me, and have told me that you wanted to attend, please email me with that. Uh, mark your calendar, please. Um, July 16th, that will be two Sundays from now, we'll be having a town hall meeting um, during our fellowship hour, a chance just to talk about how things are going, answer some questions, and kind of get caught up on how things are proceeding here at Grace. Are there other announcements? We are grateful for the band being with us today to lead our worship, um, and that that's always a special time for us to enjoy their music. Okay, with that then, I would invite you to please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned. We have hurt our community. We have squandered your blessings. We have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, Forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. God is a cup of cool water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Would you please stand and turn to face the baptismal font? O oh, come, let us join together in worship and praise. From our everyday lives we have come. O oh, come, let us bring our joys and our sorrows. From the delights and despairs of the week we have come. O oh, come, let us worship the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is our God and we are God's people. <clears throat> grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Glory to God. 
You direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the psalm. Consider and listen closely. Forget your people and your father's house. The king will desire your beauty. of the people seek your favor. All the glorious is the princess as she enters. Her gown is cloth of gold. In embroidered apparel she is brought to the king. After her the bridesmaids follow in procession. With joy and gladness they are brought, and enter into the palace of the king. In place of ancestors, O king, you shall have sons. You shall make them princes over all the earth. I will make your name to be remembered from one generation.
Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Jesus said to the 12, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. So our story time continues this week. Last week we had the story of Noah, and today as we march forward perhaps a few hundred years, we are going to hear the story of the matriarchs. Now often when we think of those people of that time, our mind goes quickly to the patriarchs, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. But when we think about the matriarchs, it gets a little bit more complicated, shall we say. So, uh, the women, here we are. Some generations after the flood, God appeared to Abram, as he was called at that time, and he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to pack up everything you and your household and your servants and your family and your animals and your pots and your pans, all of it. And I want you to go where I'm going to tell you to go. And Abraham did this. He and his wife Sarai, her name was changed a bit later, they proceeded to pack up everything and head out from their home, which was Haran, now, Haran was in southeast Turkey today, and they were en route to Canaan, which is Israel today. It's a distance of about 500 miles. You can imagine how long that may have taken with the entourage that they were traveling with. And of course, there were fights and disputes along the way. Uncle Abraham and his nephew Lot got into it, and the war of words became a war of weapons, but that's for another time. Sarah, Sarah. Sarah knew the promise that God had made to Abraham. You may remember we've spoken of it before. It's one of my favorite images in scripture, along with the other 43. Um, Ab Abraham was brought out in the dark of night and God said, look up into the heavens and count the stars if you can. So many will your descendants be. Which was pretty startling because at that time Abraham and Sarah had no children. And they waited. And they waited. And they waited and remembered the promise, the promise that had been made, the promise that they were holding on to, yet there was that time when Sarah laughed at the incre incredulous nature of this promise. And not only did she laugh, she became impatient. And she came up with a plan. This probably would be her plan B. God would have been plan A but Sarah had plan B. And she went to Abraham and she said, I'll tell you what, you know that woman Hagar? Hagar is my maidservant. This is my plan. You go into Hagar, you lie with her, and then maybe she'll have a son. And Abraham, I wonder what was going through his mind. Abraham did, and Hagar did, and lo and behold, Hagar got pregnant and Ishmael was born. Well, even though it was Sarah's plan B, Sarah wasn't any too happy about this because it kept on showing her her own infertility, which was a point of shame for women at that time. 
And so she and Hagar started to get into it a little bit, more than a little bit, and it went on and on, and finally Hagar and Ishmael had had it. And Hagar went out into the desert by herself with no supplies and planned, I'm sure, on dying. But God came to Hagar and said, you know what, I really want you to go back. And so Hagar did. She went back, and then you know what happened. Sarah got pregnant. Oh, the stories then, right? And there is the story, the one that confounds children, the story of Abraham taking his son Isaac, whom he had waited for for so long, up a mountain, prepared to sacrifice him. That, too, is a story for another time. And then... Isaac grew into a young man. And the time came when Sarah died, and she was buried in the new land that they were in, not back in her homeland. And then something happens that we don't hear too much about. Abraham took another wife. Her name is Keturah. And not only that, but he had six sons with her. We don't hear about that very often. And I think that we don't hear of these sons anymore in Scripture aside from their being named. So that was generation one. Generation two. Well, after Sarah died, Abraham, um, being the good father, had promised that uh, had promised Sarah that their son Isaac would have a wife from the homeland, back from their people. And Abraham kept his promise, and he sent a servant back there over those hundreds of miles. And the servant came after a long journey, came to a well. Remember the well. Came to the well, and there was a woman there who came and saw that he was thirsty and the animals with him and offered him water, and then offered to water the animals Rebecca was her name, and the servant knew in his heart of hearts that this is the one who is to be the wife of Isaac. So he entered into a transaction with Rebecca's father. It really wasn't a courtship. It was a transaction. And then they went back to Isaac. Well, generation two had some of the same problems as generation one, And Rebecca wasn't getting pregnant, but there were no maidservants this time. They waited and waited, and then finally, Rebecca was pregnant. She conceived. And as this pregnancy went along, she noticed that there was this fighting, it seemed like, going on in her womb. Ah, twins, twins. Esau and Jacob, they would be named. And the fighting continued between Esau and Jacob, each of them jockeying for place and position, not only in the womb, but after they were born and as they were growing. Who did mom love most? Well, that would be Jacob. Who would dad bless? That would be Jacob. Who would carry on the family name? That would be Jacob. What about Esau? Esau ended up marrying Uncle Ishmael's daughter. Her name was Mahalath. Yeah, he married his cousin. Not sure what to make of that. We'll let that one go to the side. And so it was time for Jacob to take a wife. And so he went back to his grandfather's homeland to find a wife. And he stopped by a well, the same well that Rebecca had come to. And along came Rachel, and Jacob was smitten. And so he had jewels and property and all of this to negotiate the the transaction by which he would procure his wife. And 
the plan was made. But it took a long time because there was some scheming that went on with this. But finally, after some years, the time came, the night came, that Jacob would take Rachel as his wife. He went in, and the next morning, he realized it was not Rachel that he had been with. It was Rachel's older sister, Leah. And father explained it this way, it would have been just shameful for my younger daughter to get married first, so yes, I sent Leah in to you, and she is now your wife. Well, Jacob was not particularly pleased with that plan, and so he set about trying to figure out how he could have Rachel as his wife. Um, That would be his second wife. So he came up with a plan. It, It involved years and schemes and trickery and deception. But finally, finally, the time came. And so Jacob was heading back to his homeland with Leah, his wife, and Rachel, his life, his wife, sorry, whom he loved the most. I wonder how that sat with Leah. So generation three then, generation three is in the offing and this is the most complicated of all. Like Sarah and Rebecca, Rachel wasn't getting pregnant. She waited and waited and waited to bear a son for Jacob, but Leah beat her to the punch. Leah had four sons. In desperation, Rachel remembered the plan that Sarah had, and Rachel offered her handmaid, who is Bilhah, to Jacob. And Bilhah had two sons. Then, surprise of surprise, Rachel, who had been infertile, Rachel had two sons. Then, I don't know what she was thinking, but Leah offered her handmaid, whose name was Zilpah, to Jacob, and she had two sons. Then, Leah had two more, and then Rachel had one more and died in childbirth. Generation three. So let's go back. Generation one. Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac. Generation two. Isaac and Rebekah and Esau and Jacob. And generation three. I need a separate piece of paper for this one. Generation three, Jacob and Rachel and Leah and Bilhah and Zilpah. By Leah, the four sons first were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. And then later, remember, she had two more, Issachar and Zebulun. Then by Bilhah, a surrogate mother, we might say, There was Dan and Naphtali. Then by Zilpah, a surrogate mother for Leah, there was Gad and Asher. And then by Rachel, there was Joseph and Benjamin. And giving birth to Benjamin, Rachel died. Generation three, the 12 sons of Jacob, who would become the 12 tribes, Hmm. the matriarchs. So um, again, following the story that we'll have as we go through these Sunday school stories, uh, we have a little bit of teaching to kind of get some context and so forth here. So what I've described for you um, thus far is really only a bare skeleton of the arrangements and the relationships and the parents and the children and the step-parents and the surrogates. And oh yeah, 
We didn't talk about daughters, only sons. Well, there was one daughter that was born, oops, I'm not sure which of the four potential mothers, Rachel, Leah, Zilpah, or Bilhah was her mother, but a daughter was born to Jacob, and her name was Dina. And Dina encountered a very tragic event in her life, and that too is another story. You see, each of these people have stories that go with them, and those stories sometimes are quite complicated. Can, have you imagined a family tree like that of Jacob? I can't, I can't even imagine that, but it was real. So the stories that we didn't hear so much about was the sacrifice of Isaac, right? We learned one of the most horrifying stories, I think, for a child in Sunday school to learn about is the sacrifice of Isaac, um, even though it has a good ending because God provided the sacrifice. And there was the fight then um, between Abraham and Lot, which was um, a, a very significant fight that went on for years and years and resulted in a reconciliation. And then there was the fight between Jacob and Esau and all the ways that Jacob outfoxed Esau. Oh my goodness. There, and was helped along the way by his mother, right? It wasn't just Jacob's idea. And then um, earlier on, we have the negotiation between Abraham and God, right? We call that prayer. Um, and and Abraham was very concerned about Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed. And so there was a story. These stories are amazing, and I commend them to you. If we were to really delve into all of these, um, we would still be here Tuesday when the fireworks were starting. Uh, but I commend these stories to you. So it is that from the sons of Jacob, we have the 12 tribes um, that we know of going forward. So um, next Sunday, we are going to be picking up um, with the story of Joseph, one of the sons. Okay. So grace to you and peace from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So when people ask me how many children I have, my response invariably is, it depends on how you count them. When I married my husband, I inherited two sons, and then I gave birth to another. Not nearly as complicated as those that we heard about today in, this, in the generations of Abraham. Now, as I pondered over the matriarchs these last couple of weeks, I was taken by the complicatedness, um, to be honest with you. Um, I didn't appreciate how, um, how intricate and intertwined all of these relationships were until I sat down and plotted them out pretty specifically. I thought about those convoluted relationships amongst the men and their wives and their concubines and their surrogates. And to be honest with you, I thought rather wryly about biblical family values that we hear about. And I thought, huh, these are our forebears in faith, these people. Now, what do these three generations of people offer us? Abraham shows us deep faith, faith that propelled him into action, faith in a God who made amazing promises to him, faith that accompanied him on a long trek from one home to another a distance of about 500 miles, faith that sustained him his 175 years, faith that endured despite disappointment, 
despite family discord of major proportions, faith that impelled him to look up each night to the stars in the sky as he remembered the promises of God. And Sarah, Sarah was oh so human, wasn't she? She hung in there with a husband who had seemingly impossible dreams in a land far away. She had a sardonic sense of humor and laughed at the seeming impossibility of God keeping God's promises to her. She didn't see things working out the way that she thought that God would have them, so plan B, she took things into her own hands, or rather, into Hagar's. Faithful over the decades, despite her doubts. Hagar, Hagar a handmaid, one of no importance, yet one who gave Abraham his first son. Hagar who went into the desert in despondency because life was so difficult, what with Sarah's hatred and jealousy. Hagar, to whom God appeared with words of comfort and provision. Rebecca, Rebecca who met a man at the well and then bid goodbye to her family and traveled to another land to marry Isaac. Rebecca, who birthed twins and loved one more than the other. Rebecca, who joined in and even crafted some of the schemes of her favorite son. Rebecca, who was a master of deception herself. Yet, Rebecca stood in a line of faithful ones. And then the sisters, Rachel and Leah, Rebecca's daughters-in-law, Leah always knew that Jacob loved Rachel more. Rachel, who suffered the shame of infertility. Each of them uncertain of God's faithfulness, and so, like Sarah, they each tried to handle things on their own because they too had heard the story passed down through the generations about the stars in the sky. And they were determined to help God bring this about. Now talk about a complicated family. Two wives, two surrogate wives, 12 sons, and that one daughter, Dina. So this is what I want you to know. Oh wait, I want to go back. Because Rachel also, of course, met Jacob at the well. That same well that Rebecca was at. And my friends the same well that Jesus met the Samaritan woman at some centuries later. So this is what I want you to know about the matriarchs. They lived complicated lives. <laughs> they made many mistakes. They had times of faltering faith. Yet, God never left their side. <clears throat> God was persistently present with them as God is persistently present with us as well, each of us individually and all of us collectively as a community of faith. We too have lives that are complicated. We too have times of faltering faith. We too have made decisions that have long-reaching impacts that were not what we expected. Some of those decisions have not been the most prudent. Yet, God's promises are sure. I rather think that like Abraham, God would take us by the hand in the dark of night and tell us to look up and see the stars and tell us this, as many as those stars are, so are the pieces of God's grace in your lives, pieces of God's grace lived out to touch others as well as ourselves. God made a covenant, a heartfelt promise with the patriarchs and the matriarchs. And God has made a covenant promise with us as well in the waters of our baptisms. God keeps God's promises. May we walk daily 
in the grace of those promises, sop and wet, and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you please stand? We confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. abundant mercy let us offer our prayers for a world in need we pray for the church for wisdom to heed the voices of prophets in our midst who cast a vision of God's promised future for courage to welcome people whose society rejects for resolve to serve all in need God in your mercy Hear our prayer. we pray for creation for all rivers, 
lakes, oceans, and streams, for land experiencing scorching heat, drought, or wildfires, for conservation organizations and environmental activists, for scientists working on clean energy solutions. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this nation and all nations, for presidents, governors, and legislators, for judges, juries, district attorneys, and public defenders, for military personnel, for those who are incarcerated. Guide us in the ways of freedom that promote the common good. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in need, for exiles, immigrants, refugees, and those seeking asylum, for victims of harassment, torture, or abuse, for those who are ill, particularly Arlene, Sherry, Mabel, Mike, Anna Mae, Caden, Barbara, Michael, Julie, Carol, Ann, Lydia, Paul, Will, Betty, Bob, Jane, Scott, Ron, Flo, Terry, Doris, Dottie, Teresa, Marion, Tim, Betty, Bev, Julie, Henry, Mary, Greg, and Max. And Anne Joyce. And Anne Joyce. For any near death and for all who grieve, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for children, for their safety at home and in child care settings, for their flourishing at summer programs and camps, for the many people who care for them, including parents and grandparents, child care workers and teachers, coaches, counselors, mentors, pediatricians, and psychologists. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks this day, Lord, for the country in which we have been born. We thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed. I ask, Lord, that you empower us with leaders and governors and presidents and all rulers who will hold fast to the ideals that are the foundation for our country. Indeed, for our faith in you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We give thanks for all the saints and prophets who have received the free gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May their lives of humble service inspire us in faith. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive our prayers and answer us, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. We share a sign of that peace with one another. We prepare now to receive our offerings as we return to God a portion of that which God has entrusted to us.
Would you please stand? As the grains of wheat once scattered on the hill were gathered into one to become our bread, so may all your people from all the ends of earth be gathered into one in you. As this cup of blessing Generous God, in this meal you offer your very self. We give thanks for these gifts of the earth. In the breaking of this bread, reveal to us the risen one. In the pouring of this wine, pour us out in service to the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God, power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the words of the prophets, and at this end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, 
Christ will come again. Therefore, O God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive your inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Friends, this is the Lord's table, and it is the Lord who bids you come and feast. We commune at the altar rail, and as you come down the center aisle, please go to the furthest, which side is that? Left side. Furthest left side um, on the respective rail that you come to. Please come. All is now ready.
rejoice in your presence. the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, preserve us unto life everlasting. Amen. Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. With your word and this meal of grace, you have nourished our life together. Strengthen us to show your love and serve the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I invite you now to join into our sending hymn. Um, following which we will have the benediction in, as we form our circle. Before you, Lord, we So I would invite you then to move from your spots over into the side aisles. I know we are, there are a few of us today because of a holiday weekend, um, but we could do that as we prepare to depart this place. So the words that we're using today are from the closing of Paul's letter to the Romans, and he exhorts them to do this. Love one another. Love one another. Overcome evil with good. Be patient, in Be patient in affliction. Rejoice with one another. Count the lowly as your friends. 
live peaceably, live peaceably with all. Live peaceably with all. And may the blessing of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Amen.